put your hands together all the way from Arizona. He does a lot of consultants. Steve Hooper. Thank you. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today and hopefully in uh, the few minutes that we have can share a few things that give you perspective on the phases of your company and growth. You know, you're sitting here, you're new startups, and you're saying, we want growth. Well, sometimes you've got to be careful what you ask for. Uh, Jerry's talked about a couple. Quorum International, we did 10 million our first year, 125 million our second year, 200 million, 250, 300, opened 11 countries in the first 24 months. I didn't sleep much. I, I had just gotten married six months before I joined the company. I didn't even know who I was married to for a period of time. And this, if that wasn't enough, I left Quorum and went to New Vision, and we went from 10 million to 200 million in one year. So as you sit here and as you have a vision and as you have a dream of things that, uh, and as has been spoken to earlier, I was just talking with Dan Jensen as well too, there are promises that you make. You have to have a team that actually helps you make those promises come true. And hopefully today we can just have a conversation. I mean, if we go back to like the 1500s, it was a symbol of wealth when you could bring meat home and put it on the table, much like today it's kind of a symbol of wealth. And they would come and they would hang it in the corner and the, the father figure there would go out and he would invite people over and they'd go over to that ham or whatever's there and they'd actually carve a few pieces off and they'd sit around and chew the fat. So we're gonna sit around and chew the fat here for just a few minutes if we could. Um, you know, one of the things that I spend a lot of time with uh, company owners is, is talking about the future. And in order to talk about the future, we have to understand the past, have to assess where they are at the present, and then we try and predict the future, and we can't always predict it. But as Mark Twain said, I'm very interested in the future because I plan on spending all the rest of my time in it. So I think that that's appropriate here. You know, there was a sociological study of uh, some 90-year-olds, and they were asked a question, if you could, you know, go back and change something in your life, what would you do? And there were three common answers. The first one was, I would reflect more. Next one is I would risk more. And the third one is I would do more that would last after I'm gone from this earth. So as you sit here with that dream in your mind, that passion as to what it is you want, what is your vision that was spoken earlier, what do you sell, but then what do you market? Uh, that's what we want to talk about today is maybe some of those things that you're willing to risk and that you're willing to do a little bit more. They weren't talking about money or fame or power. They were talking about things that were bold, that were meaningful, that were outside of themselves. So with that, let's talk about, Einstein was once asked this question, what is the most powerful force in the universe? Any idea? Jerry, what would you say? What's the most powerful force in the universe? Anybody else want to volunteer? Sure. Belief, faith. Belief, faith. Anything else? Kevin? An idea whose time has come. He actually said it was compound interest. <laughs> Most powerful force in the universe. Now, how do we apply that? If we were to apply that to our business, I would say it's exponential growth. That is the most powerful force, and it's what we all want, what we're all hoping for in terms of running our businesses. Let me put things in perspective. We've talked about this being a new world, a new distribution model, especially today. Let me put some numbers up here that have no meaning whatsoever to you yet. And I apologize they're not in the notes. And these few slides have just cobbled together the last few days. Things that, you know, just you get these thoughts and impressions. 1 in 1M, 1,300, 1,100. How many of you, when you were a young child, your mom said, oh, you're one in a million? You know, there were six kids in my family. My mom would always say, I'm worth $6 million. Well, if you're one in a million in China, there are 1,300 people just like you. We heard about Amway's $2 billion success there, 22 licensed companies. In India, there are 1,100 people just like you. During the course of this presentation, 60 babies will be born in the US, 244 in China, and 351 in India. 61B, 37B. That's how many searches are done annually using Google and all of the others. Google controls the market 37 billion searches a year. Who did we ask those questions to before Google came around? <laughs> That's the big <laughs> Who knew? You know? It's gotten to the point where we're going to 
you know, it's no longer BC and AD, it's now BG and AG, before Google and after Google. Ten-year-old company that prior to the current economic slump that we're in, within 10 years they became, from market capitalization perspective, the ninth largest company in the world. ExxonMobil is number one in terms of market cap. Ten years, that's the kind of growth that they experienced. Greater than 200M slash five. How many of you have MySpace pages? There are over 200 million registered users on MySpace today. That would make them the fifth largest country in the world, right behind Indonesia and right before Brazil. There are over 100 million Facebook users, which would make that them about the 11th country after Japan and right before Mexico. That's what we're dealing with. And then one in eight, one in eight marriages in our country today came from people who met online. Interesting number. 2010, 10, 2004, by the year 2010, the 10 most in-demand jobs would not, will not have existed four years ago. The 10 most in-demand jobs two years from now did not exist in 2004. Department of Labor prediction study. Also a part of that part, Department of Labor, they said by the time you're 38 years old, you will have held as many as 14 different jobs. The average they're expecting today for a 38-year-old is somewhere between 10 and 14 different jobs, which talks about a continual need for re-education, for training, ongoing development, teaching analytical skills, assessment skills, team group dynamics, and how to work within those, because you're going to be retooling, relearning, every 18 months. One in four people have been on their job less than one year. One out of two have been with their current employer less than five years. The average net worth of an American is less than $15,000. Average family net worth, less than $15,000. And yet, uh, again, prior to our current downturn, there was a new millionaire created every 14 minutes in this country. So this is a place of opportunity in the business that we're part of. And with that all being said, you know, it's shift happens. Not to confuse it with that other term out there, but it's going to happen. It's going to happen in your business. You have to be prepared for it and have to, to know and see those telltale signs. How would you like to have 2,000% growth in 12 months? How would you like to go through three computer systems, three phone systems, as if they were disposable in 12 months? And you have to be willing to make decisions. You have compressed time frames that you're working with when shift happens. And so it's an ability to see those, to predict them based on analyzing what's going on within your business, and then to plan and execute. And again, you might be executing on very short windows, very short strategies that we're working with here. You know, and all I'm going to ask you is, are you prepared to meet those business transitions? So if we could start talking about those. You know, Metcalf Law, Robert Metcalf was kind of the founder of 3Com Corporation, which we all know, we all have those little ethernet cables if we've got our homes, our businesses wired, certainly more of a wireless world today. But Metcalf developed a law that I think applies uh, quite well to what we do within this business. And, this, and his law is that the economic value of a network, and whether it's a computer network, whether it's a people network, and I'll use the, also the word power, the economic power of a network, equals the number of users squared. Let me give you an example here. You sign up your first distributor. What's the economic value of that? It's not much. It's not, it's not worth anything until you go get the second, because two squared equals four, and we have exponential growth. I've gone from one squared equaling one to two squared equaling four. I now have the warm markets of each of those people. You know, when the first cell phone, or today, when the first BlackBerry was sold, who was going to send you an email? When the first fax machine was sold, who are you going to fax? It's not until we start adding users and building and honoring this law and multiplying and duplicating, which is a word we hear within this, it's not until we bring on additional users, and each user allows us to leverage the power of this law and the leverage of a network and bring value to it. So you bring 10 distributors, your economic value is now 10 squared, it's 100. And so what we want to talk about and what we'll, we'll look through today is some of the values of, of activities and what we're going to see 
with respect to how a company grows. Um, phases of growth, just to put it quickly and certainly something you understand. There are different management and leadership requirements at each phase of growth. How does a company go from startup to $200 million in two years? Do you really think the same team that got you to, to that first 10 million, the, first, the next 10 million to 200 million, is it the same team after two years? I see Linda shaking her head, probably not. You know, you can grow so quickly that it's not that people are incapable, it's more that they are inexperienced. How do you take a call center manager who's managing four people, what happens if you double in sales this month? All of a sudden she's got eight, you double again. She has 16, you double again, she's at 32. Can that individual manage the activities required and oversee that, that number? And again, it's not that they can't do it, it's just we may not have the time to allow them to do it. How would you like to double in sales every month for 15 consecutive months? It'd be great. I've had it happen. It hurts. It is. It's painful. It's not pr growth is not pretty. It's hard to be perfect. And all of the things that we're trying to do out here, we're trying to be perfect. Uh, we're trying to keep these people in the business. We're trying to not only fulfill our promises to them, but the promises that they make to their friends and family. And so what we have to understand is that shift happens. And it's going to happen at a personnel standpoint, at a, at a business process standpoint, at a technology, all the things that we do. So with that, you know, I'm one that kind of puts the phases. I'm just going to put all four of them up here. And we're going to talk a little bit about these phases. Now, I'm not going to attach dollars to this because dollars don't mean anything to me if I'm having to fulfill your promises. What is meaningful to me is the number of touches that I'm going to have in order to execute a sale, a sign up, a sale, a shipment, communications that then attach to that. And so I'm looking at a business a little bit differently. It's transactional based. How many touches do we have? How many SKUs are you carrying? How many average line items per order? What does it take in order to fulfill that order? I'm going to back up for that and say how many inbound contacts am I going to have via email, via phone, the old fax method that we still use, live chat sessions. Uh, we talked about, it was mentioned earlier, the texting campaigns that are going on. Those are all things. How many contacts do I have in order to support one transaction? And that's what we look for. So I put these into four categories based on my experience. Uh, being from Arizona, we, you know, the wild, wild west is very appropriate. That's what it is. When you're, a, you know, 10 orders a day, it's going to be anything goes. We then move up into what we call creative chaos at 100 orders a day. We then want to get a little bit predictable, less creative, more predictable when we hit that 1,000 orders a day. And then it's, we become an institution at 5,000 orders a day. So if I could, I'm just going to talk about each of these. And again, um, hopefully I'll try and keep it conversational as we go. If you have questions about these, please do so. I mean, there are stories that we could talk about each of these, but hopefully you're starting to look at the strategic issues that you have as a company, and how would you lead and manage a company that transitions from one phase to the next? Dan? Why is, why is there an emphasis on the number of orders per day? Why not the a couple of things. I mean, new orders is one component. I mean, a uh, couple of things that I do. I, we've got um, probably about 12 KPIs, key performance indicators that are looked at. And I did, sign ups is one of those. But sign ups, depending on where you are in the stage of your company, sign ups, if you're a growth company, like for example, and this is public information, when I was at New Vision, we were signing up 4,000 people a day for two years. 4,000 people a day for two years. So sign-ups were critical to us. But if I'm a company that, and the majority of our sales volume came from those new sign-ups. So as a result, we did look at sign-ups. We looked at the business generated from them. We, in month two, we then looked at the auto ship activity that was attached to them. And as Dave spoke about earlier, we started looking at the life cycle and how do we extend that life cycle and what do we need to do to communicate with them throughout. But you can take a mature company that's been around for 20 years, 
New business takes on less of a percentage, and so signups, while it is one of those KPIs, signups is not as critical as some of the other indicators or metrics that they're using to see how their business is, is going to push forward. So it, does that answer your question? Any others? Like I said, we'll, we'll, we'll talk through these, but if we could first, let's just talk about this notion of the wild, wild west. And, I, and, and again, let's put these up here so we can talk about them somewhat uh, in detail. Um, you know, what is it in the 10 orders a day? What's your goal? You've got one goal, it's growth. There is no other goal that you have other than how do I grow? And then what is a crisis that you face as a company? Your crisis that you face is survival because I have to generate enough cash flow as a company in order to get me into next month. So I've got a goal of growth, a crisis of survival. So what happens? And again, this is my experience that, that I've seen. I've probably been able to look under the hood of about 75 or 80 companies now. I'm approaching that you know, century mark. You know, Mark and others, uh, Dan, uh, how many of you looked at through the years? Over 800. Over 800. See, I'm, I'm just a neophyte when it comes to this. But again, mine is that operational side. How do we fulfill that promise? So what, what, what have I seen as we go on and look at this? You know, they're making it up. It's, um, how many hands were here that this is your first time in this industry? Okay, it's a new experience for you. This is a first time occurrence. There are things that you're gonna see and experience that you really, unless you have a resource, I think Linda is working with you there, saying she's got 30 years of experience. Unless you have someone that you can tap into, you've got first time occurrences. So things are gonna be a bit muddy or flexible or whatever term that we want. We have to make it up. We, we don't have, other than traditional business experience, and my experience is, you know, I come from Deloitte. I've got a formal accounting background, a systems background. I mean, I've been schooled in all of those processes and everything else. And it was a leap of faith for me to step into direct selling. It's like, do what? Electronic security alarms that were the size of these? And we sold them, and we sold tens of millions of them. And I was like, okay, there's an opportunity. And it, it, there was a period of conversion for me. And, uh, but, but as I look at this, I look at companies sit here saying, how am I going to survive? Well, we just have to figure it out. And you have a small enough management team or group of people that you're leveraging their collective knowledge on how to respond to issues. You know, it's seat of the pants. It's whatever. If something looks good, if it looks promising, let's do it. So what? We're 10 orders a day. Well, what can happen? We're going to go down to eight? So do it. So you get very, you're willing to take risk here at this stage, okay? As opposed to an institution that's doing 5,000 orders a day, and then the growth that I went through in 18 months went from phase two to phase five, and all of a sudden found myself going from a couple hundred orders a day to averaging 13,000 orders a day in 18 months, okay? You know, different risk, different goals, different requirements that we had as a business. Yes. At this point, you have to differentiate yourself. There's a lot of companies out there that are trying to attract your distributor. There you are. You have to still have to see how do you differentiate yourself? The big thing you've got is corporate. You've got flexibility. You can turn on a dime. You can offer people. You, you can offer people. And that's what we talk about. There's little or no structure. I mean, take a, take a company that is doing, I mean, we, I think they've mentioned a billion dollar company today. How quickly can they take and, and make a decision, implement it, and change course? They can't. Why? They're, you know, all of a sudden, that little ripple, by the time it gets out, it's a pretty big wave when it hits the individual distributor that just joined the company today. And so they, they can. They have that flexibility to respond and be creative that a large organization doesn't. I mean, they can leverage their communications a little bit easier. We talked about don't over-communicate. A small company like this, guess what? The president knows every distributor by name. I sat with a group, the president said, we're having an event, give me the list, and he called every one of them by name and invited them to come to conference. That's the flexibility that he had. Now, from a decision making, they can also sit there and go, this isn't working, we can stop it and change it today, period. Okay, we have 100 active distributors, 1,000 active distributors. 
People aren't making significant incomes yet, and if we need to make a change, we can today. And so you do have great flexibilities that goes there. Uh, little or no structure. You know, how many titles? There aren't any. How many layers of management? There aren't layers of management. Any employee can walk into the president's office and say, I just got a phone call, or I just got an instant message, or we were sitting here in a chat session. The distributor asked if they could do this. The president will sit there and go, yeah, let's do that. And so it's a, it's a very you know, dynamic, fluid process because we're not wrapped up or we're not departmentalized or compartmentalized yet. What we've done is said, we're going to do whatever we need to do to create growth, again, within legal realms. Now, I know Jerry shared his Zango story, or elevator story. I had one last night, got in the elevator. A couple of ladies got on. Two Zango distributors got on. They engaged them real quickly that you sit back and go, great. They're, they're already, they're, they've got that elevator pitch that they're doing. And uh, the two women who were on were medical professionals, and they said, have we got a product for you? It has healing capabilities. And I just sat there and I said, excuse me, um, you know, you can't make product claims. And uh, one of the two distributors said, you're exactly right, thank you. I said, you can't, you know, but that's what they're, you know, you, you look at these companies starting, they will say and do whatever they have to do to try and get business and to try and get excitement and get that awareness. You know, we start looking at special deals. Yeah, there's a key leader. Give them whatever they need. We will support them. We will be at their events. We will give them tools. You know, don't worry about it. Just get it out there. We're trying to leverage the law of large numbers. We want massive exposures to our business right now. We'll do whatever it takes. And the other thing that's really important here is we know who's generating the business. I can sit there and, you know, there's a group that I work with, and they've got leader profiles publish leader profiles each month that get distributed to the executive team based on those KPIs. We look at those KPIs within distributor sales organizations and we can see who's up and down in what key areas and what it does is that triggers a communication. You know, we sat with one group and we divided the top leaders across the executive team and we sat and we review those KPIs, distributor KPIs with them on a monthly call. Each executive, even though I was, you know, in the closet with all the IT and operations and commissions people, I had five field leaders that I had to call and review their KPIs with them. Gave me great under, a better understanding of how their business worked, better way that I could support them and what technologies and things that I needed to deliver on in order to help them fulfill their promises as well as our own promises. Any questions about, again, this is a, a very fluid time and it's one that you, you're going through. We've got, got a startup right here. How many others are of us in startup phase? Here's the hands. It's like, how do I create growth? And what am I willing to do within the legal environment to do it? As you think about progression and the evolution of a company from the, you know, the, the 10 orders to 100 orders to 1,000, how do you think about that? Because it's a personality required or what makes you want to do something about okay, I'm going to do X amount of employees per 10 per 100 per and, okay, and we'll carry through some of that discussion because right now what you generally see is there's, there's again, less departmentalization here. At 10 orders a day, please, it, it's, you know, I can take care of that even as a business owner. And that's how involved. That's why you know where the business is coming from. I know that you had a meeting last night and there were five people at it and here's who else came and the night before and there were guests. So it, there's that proximity to knowledge that you have at this stage. So there really isn't a lot of need. Now, what it does play into, what your question is, you know, how do I take from 10 orders to 100, and what do I start doing from an, a human resource or capital, um, human capital, what do I need? And that's where we look at those touch points and contacts, and we start to say, if you, if you will give me a sales plan, how many distributors do you think you'll need to bring in? We will sit down there and we work out a framework and say, here's what you're going to need in order to staff it give you an example, walked into a company, uh, it's been uh, about a year and a half ago, call center manager came up to me first day and said, I need to hire more people, you need to go talk to the owner of the company. I said, okay, please give me your metrics. Sat down and looked at call center performance, evaluated how they were doing, and they went back to her and said, great news, you can cut your staff by 50% today and still deliver an exceptional level of customer service. 
something she was not prepared for because she didn't, again, had never been in that position before. Now that's one of the things that we do struggle with at this phase of a company is it's friends and family a lot of times. And you're putting people in positions that they may not have experience with, but they're willing to work hard and do whatever it takes. And when we get into the next segments, that will, that's where we start to look for expertise with a specific knowledge to attach it to a group and how to manage that group. But right now, there are things that, that we're just trying to do is, how do I get to 100 orders a day? So then the question, I guess, then as you train, train, I guess, as you move into the next segment, which is how far ahead do you need to be? Right. Um, and, and then secondly, are there formulas as you go through every evolution of the life cycle? And, and um, I think there are formulas based on company. As you go through that, there are predictors. And again, by looking at the past, there are predictors that we can create a a distributor life cycle, and, if, and we can look at a retention life cycle, and we'll come in and attack those and say, how do we improve? But based on prior performance, if we were to do nothing else and just grow, we can predict, and the same, I could look at you in your life and say, based on the last five years of your life, if you told me what you had done, I could predict the next five years for you if you do nothing different. So what do we need to do different and what areas can we impact in order to move that up to the next group? And that's what we're looking for. And that's where we do then set in place models that would say, okay, what is my projected headcount now? And what do I need to support it from an infrastructure? Uh, I'll give an example. Went into a company and they said, in two years our goal is to be $100 million. In two years. $100 million is $8.3 million a month. We can back that in based on average order size, 100 orders, you can work it, how much business do you need to do a day in order to do $8 million? And they showed me, said, we're getting ready to sign a lease on a property and it's 2,000 square feet. And I laughed. <laughs> I mean, there's some things you don't do, but I said, do you understand how many transactions you need on a daily basis to fulfill that promise or that goal? We worked back through the exercise and showed them, they said, oh, so we immediately signed 15,000, and within six months, we were at 50,000, and six months later, we're at 100,000 square feet. So again, I'm gonna carry it back to transactions, because that's what it, and I went from, a, went from 10 employees to 500 employees in 18 months. That's what. Now, as, as you move from, I don't know if you wanna call that the embryonic stage or whatever, and people that may be in your organization at that time that are used to certain levels of flexibility, is that a trade-off they're typically willing to make in exchange for the efficiency that's implemented in the larger organization? It's, do you understand the question? As we go from you know, this embryonic stage, Wild Wild West, to the next phase, we've got employees that have been in positions, may, may or may not have the right... And, and not necessarily employees, but just you know, your, your field uh, people as well. No, not always, especially as we move to phase three and four of a company. That's where, again, I think the company tries to exercise more control. But as we, you know, the, the, what, what I see at these companies, because we are so flexible right here, and what we're trying to do again is stimulate growth, if we, if we achieve that growth, all of a sudden we're gonna be in a position where the dynamics start to change. We need to put in more systems and processes as it was talked about earlier, to deliver training within the first 90 days. We need to formalize some of those activities, and that does start to infringe on them somewhat. And what you find is not only distributors, but employees will either say, this is too much for me, or you know, I actually signed up for something else. Um, and it, but again, it's, it's gonna be uh, you know, somewhat specific to the company and what the culture that the management team of the company sets up front as to how flexible that they want that to be in the beginning. There's some of you that are highly regulated. And so as a result, I mean, if it's financial services and insurance, and you know, there are others that are specific product claims, uh, end claim claims, things that we're trying to do. So it's a question of, you know, as we move through those, but how much flexibility do we give to a volunteer or army that may or may not choose to actually talk about this business opportunity today? And how do we take that new person and how do we in, ingrain them into the fabric of the company as quickly as possible? And can we do that with all of them doing their own you know, little programs? And what resistance, and what resistance are we gonna get? I mean, we talked about, um, it was mentioned earlier about field councils and leadership councils. 
You know, what criteria do we use? At what point in the company do we actually put that in place? When do we need it? You know, does a new company need that, Sandy? Yeah, I'm sorry. But I, I, I would love it if you could explain the difference between a company like Quorum and a new scale. Because I'm hearing Quorum is ambitious. Quorum coming from the industry with years and years of experience and launching their companies, which is a little bit different from some of the folks that are in here that would fall into that that one to ten order category versus a company like a new vision that brought with them from another company a lot of okay. people and they get the road running and have the expertise in house. Okay, let's talk about, all right, so the question, how do we con contrast, and I'll use mine, a, a quorum, which was a startup company when I joined, limited network, prior network and marketing experience to a company like New Vision. The Bareko family was in the Matal organization. About 80% of the volume of the Matal organization flowed through their sales organization. They were distributors, they were field leaders, had never run a company before in their life. Quorum, on the other hand, was uh, the owner was a, uh, an original equipment manufacturer for Atari and Coleco and Mattel, and they came up with a product and said, how do we take this to market? And so they found some network marketers that could come in and handle the sales and marketing of the business. Now, what we had there was uh, a publicly held company in Hong Kong. In our first year in business, second year in business, we were four times larger than our parent company. So here they are, publicly held, had a 70% stake in us, four times larger. What do you think they're going to do? They're going to try and exert control. All of the manufacturing management moved from Hong Kong and got put right into a sales and marketing business. And they wanted to now try and tell us how to run our business. You know, it's 3 o'clock in the morning in Phoenix. It gets pretty hot in August. It's only about 120, 122 on a good day. And when the president of the company calls you and says, it's too hot. Do something about it. I'm like, please, <laughs> you know. It's a, it's a holiday. It's the 4th of July. Moved in, actually, Memorial Day. Moved into a new building. Call all the employees and tell them to come in and work today. We said, we can't. Why? Well, have you heard of Abraham Lincoln? Yes, great American president. Well, he abolished slavery in this country. So there were some cultural issues that we're dealing with. But the flexibility wasn't there. I mean, I, I can go on with the stories without... I mean, that's where, you know, at some point all of us are going to collectively write a book or you're going to see us with on screen, we're telling our stories and in therapy and crying and, you know, but it, that's the amazing, this is a great entrepreneurial where the average person, going back to Metcalf's Law, can leverage the value of a network and create something. And that's what I love about this business. New Vision, on the other hand, came out of Mattel, uh, had field leaders galore walk in, and day one, they were profitable. Day one, they had leadership in place, systems in place. What they didn't have was the knowledge of running a company. And when they said, 2,000 square feet, what do you think? And I laughed. I mean, that's what they didn't, they didn't have that perspective of what it took to sustain three or four or 5,000 field leaders that came with them. You know, there's an established company, the December of, was it 1994, conference called by the president of the company saying, I'm sorry, you're not going to get paid this month. What do you do? You're a leader. You're, you're, you've got a sales organization with tens of thousands of people. They started a company within 90 days because they weren't going to lose the relationships that they had created. Now, there were trade-offs there. And, and especially trade-offs as to, they were very flexible. We've got the first compensation plan was written on a napkin on a Southwest Airlines flight. Wanted to pay out 65%. How many of you can pay that out and survive? Anybody? It's not going to happen. I mean, there, there are multiples there. There are things that we have to back into transactionally that supports the profitability of the company. But, you know, when you're a distributor, it's like, all right, if you can buy it for five cents, we can pay out 65, that'll be a tight squeeze to run it, but. So I don't know if that covered you, Sandy, there, but well, let me just try and push through some of these. I, I appreciate it. Hopefully, you know, this, this again, it's chewing the fat. I need to get you thinking about the things that you're gonna face strategically, and whether it's from an operational perspective, a sales and marketing, how do we leverage these? At what point do I bring talent in? You know, the, the next one, we'll go into what I call creative chaos. Let's go back here. I don't know how many, 
you know, creative cast, again, there's little to structure, but I think back to the question over here, this is where I see companies begin to departmentalize. You know, here's how many inbound contacts we're getting, and we may need to kind of segment order entry, customer service, or how do I handle the operations side. I may actually need to part, start putting in a sales team that can go and support events and handle trainings and the presence on the conference calls, as was talked about earlier, because when I can get that 100 orders a day, average order, $1,000, I'm doing, or $100, I'm doing, what, 10,000 a day, 20 business days, a couple hundred thousand a month. I've got a company that's really starting to, to move forward. I, I start to look at what do I need to do to get a little bit more efficient, get a little bit more understanding and control of some of these processes you're still probably proximity-based, I mean, you're in the same office. And guess what? I call it the old sneaker net. I can walk over to the desk if there's a problem. The warehouse is right here. If I need to fix an order, I can walk out and I can solve the problem before a distributor ever sees it. And so we, we deal with a, a lot of these issues. You know, we probably have one manager who controls a whole lot of processes right here. Okay, you, you generally have an office manager, somebody that really might have customer service, they might have some the op side of what's going on in the business, and then we've got the owner who's handling the sales and marketing. And so we've got a few people that control access, and if you want to get information, you've got to come through me. Now that's the hard part is because you've got to come through me. And so we, don't, we haven't necessarily empowered people, especially our service agents. We're still building what our service level agreement is with our distributors. We're trying to create this culture organizationally with our employees and establish that. And so, you know, there's a, a, a number of things that we deal with here. And like I say, there's, there's stories that we could tell, you know, about each of these. But the one here, I think back to the question is, this is generally a point of some departmentalization. We haven't compartmentalized yet. We haven't created a commissions team that that's all they do is handle commission inquiries. You know, we've only got uh, several, or whatever the number would be in terms of our customer service team, and they're more generalists. If there is a commissions problem, we're gonna go more to somebody up in the management really to take a look at it and decide what we're doing. Dan? Yes, if uh, dependent upon the growth curve of the company, if you have a nice progressive growth that they can set and experience and learn, then I think they can. But if you double in size every 30 days, um, you know, I sat with a group and said, I promise you, your manage if you grow, continue to your growth, your management team 90 days from now will have an entirely different look than it does today. There are people that will not be able to go from managing a group of four to managing a group of 20. Uh, they could do it over time. They just can't do it when it's that compressed. Yes. Correct. So is that right? Do you get a sense for that? It's what are, who are we hiring for? This becomes critical at this phase of your company is what are we hiring for? And you know, unfortunately, a lot of companies, we spend all of our time and resources on the sales and marketing side of the business. Operationally, there's a team that has to understand clearly your vision and, and they have to have a plan in place to support that. You know, I would sit on, and I would go on every conference call as an ops person. Why? Because I wanted to know what your promises were. Because I was the one that would come in and have to fulfill them. I physically located my office next to the owners of the company so I could hear all the hallway traffic and all the chatter, or whatever term they use out in the terrorist world today, the buzz, the chatter there. I needed to hear that so that I could pull the rabbit out of the hat when you walked in and said, can we do this? Yes, we can, and here's why. But it's it's because I had my own little intelligence network trying to pick up on some of the things that, that were coming about within the business. So hiring becomes critical here. And, and again, this is a time where, you know, as I've experienced, things are disposable. You're making decisions frequently that may only last you three months or six months. 
And you have to be willing to accept that. Have that within your mindset that here are things that, are gonna, that I can toss away. I can toss away a $100,000 phone system. Now, hopefully, you're buying modular and scalable plat things that you're stepping into. I mean, it's like today, we've got 20% of PBX users have moved over to the voice over IP platform. In three years, it's projected we'll be at 50%. 80% of companies are investigating it right now. There are things that you start looking at that allow you to be able to scale and scale quickly. And it speaks not only to employees that you hire, but it speaks to the relationships that you develop with key vendors. They're going to be part of your family. They're going to live with you. I mean, you know, Mark had a cot at my facility. I leased him an apartment for a few years. We got to know each other real well. We still do. We still like each other, you know, 18 years later. That was, but it was through very, some very painful growth. When the owner of the company would walk in and say, it's the 15th of the month, I want to change the compensation plan for last month. What do you do? You respond, but you've got to be in a position you, and you've got to have relationships that you can leverage. A couple of the others here, if we can, um, let's go to 1,000 orders a day. Boy, this is where we start getting real predictable. Um, there's too much complexity. There's too much data, too much money, too much, we can go right on down the list. We have to become more predictable. And so we start putting in systems and processes. We try and move from that creative chaos to more of a predictive chaos. And so we really leverage our auto, auto ship, auto advantage programs. I mean, who'd love to be Manatech? I think the last public find I looked at, they had 70 some percent of their business was on auto ship. Every month, they knew seven out of 10 orders, where they were gonna come from, on what day they could forecast, they could plan head counts, everything else that they needed, because 70, per, how would you like as a distributor to have 70% of your check guaranteed? That's what they had, 70% of it. That's what they were able to get to. Formalize their department structure, they broke it up, it's now sales and marketing versus operations. You know, ops people, you just go do what we tell you. But they create systems, you know, there's a departmental trust. What comes out of your department is, your output is my input. And I have to rely on that and be able to trust. And so there, there's this process of ensuring that these teams are able to work together. And we're gonna impose stronger policies. We're gonna get a little bit tougher from a compliance standpoint. I mean, I was a chief compliance officer once and I think it was just because of my size. It's, it's compartmentalization. Right. Right. And, and, and what is it, and what is the distributor's mindset? The distributor's sitting out there and they're seeing the first hiccups, some uncomfortable growth, and they're saying, and this is what I get when I go to field meetings, can they handle the growth? That's the number one question in a distributor's mind is, can you handle the growth? That's what they want to know. And I've got to sit there and go, yeah, we've got systems and processes in place. Bring it on. I mean, there's a little activity Mark and I worked on a couple of years ago with one group, did $14 million in business, $14 million in business in one day. We did seven million of it after the phone shut off that night. Had a counter going, just sitting there. It means, thousands at a time and you're just sitting here like, wow, this is so cool that it's all happening. Distributors are driving the transactional business. We're handling the service side of the business. And I think we're pressed time-wise. Let's go through. Yeah, I think we all know and we would love to get to this point to be an institution, but 5,000 orders a day, you know, we can't have the chaos. We have to be predictable. We have to protect the golden goose. We have to exert control. And so we go from crisis goals of growth, growth, how do I get more growth? All of a sudden it's like, how do we get stable growth? How do I go from a crisis of surviving to now it's a crisis of management and leadership? How do we lead the company to the next phase? 
And at some point, probably back in phase two or three, is when we impose we're international expansion. And you're going to have segments of your company that are at different phases of growth. How do we now management that? I've got a startup market that's doing 10 orders a day, and we're here in our home market doing 1,000 orders a day. They want to be just like us. They want everything that we have, and they want it day one. So we get into those trade-offs as an organization as to, as to how we're going to do that. And, you know, diminishing concern. This is actually where profits usually go down. We impose more structure. We've got more that we're throwing at it to leverage those resources. So again, just uh, kind of close. Management operates the business today, but the leadership has to see the future. The leadership of the company has to see the future, and we have to aim internally our people, as well as our distributors, to what we think that future is going to be. Shall we cut it off? I could Let's keep going. Let's give Steve a, a hand. Thank you.